Hello everyone. Tonight's event is a queen for all seasons with Roya Nikar, Moira Stewart and Joanna Lumley. It's to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and we're in the British Library, which the Queen opened in 1998, at the time commenting, this is the largest public building erected in Britain this century and it is entirely fitting that it should be a library. Tonight's venue also has significance as Joanna Lumley's baptismal certificate is held in the India Office records at the British Library. This isn't the only library participating in tonight's event, however. We are joined by audiences in Jersey, Rugby, Kenilworth, Worcester and Aberdeen through the Living Knowledge Network, which is a partnership of national and public libraries. We are also joined by audiences watching online. So tonight's event with Joanna Lumley and Roya Nikar is hosted by Moira Stewart. Moira made TV history when she became the first black and Caribbean female newsreader on British national television. And the appearance marked the beginning of an illustrious broadcasting career that has made her familiar to millions. This has included reading the news on News Afternoon, Sunday AM, The Andrew Marr Show and BBC Breakfast, as well as The Chris Evans Breakfast Show. Moira went on to join Classic FM, taking the helm for her own programmes, Moira Stewart's Hall of Fame concert on Saturday afternoons and her interview show, Moira Stewart Meets. Please welcome Moira Stewart. Hello, welcome to everyone here, and it's great to have you with us online. Now, as you know, our theme this evening is the 70-year reign and extraordinary life of service of Queen Elizabeth II. And leading the conversation are two absolute experts. May I start off with the illustrious, the fabulous, Dame <laughs> Joanna Lumley. Forgive the dandruff, but I got to read it. <laughs> now, Joanna has been described as our most trusted national treasure. <laughs> she was born in India, grew up in England and the Far East, and she celebrated the Queen's coronation as a schoolgirl in Kuala Lumpur. She's a celebrated actress, a former model and Bond girl, an author, and presenter. Her varied screen credits have included Absolutely Fabulous, where she played the legendary Patsy Stone, The New Avengers, and Coronation Street. She's well known for her travel documentaries, they're stunning, and as a political activist, including her work for the Gurkha Justice Campaign. Joanna's book, you gotta read it, A Queen for All Seasons, will be on sale in the foyer straight after this event, as you know. I've read it, I tell you, wow. Gosh, it was like having her beside you, it really was. Would you also welcome the magnificent, and I hope I've got the pronunciation right, <laughs> Roya Nika. Perfect. <laughs> now, Roya Nika is the royal editor for the Sunday Times, and she's a regular contributor to BBC coverage of royal events, including the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex in 2018, the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh last year, and of course, the forthcoming Platinum Jubilee celebrations. As royal editor, she secured exclusive uh -huh, interviews <laughs> with the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Sussex. And she's presented royal documentaries, including Prince William, Monarch in the Making, and Meghan and Harry, The Baby Years. Now, let me turn to my glorious guests, ask them the first question, and may I turn to you first, my love, your damehood, Hello, your wonderfulness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your earliest memories of the Queen. What sparked your interest in following her life and work? I was in Malaya, Malaysia, as it is now, at the army school. My father was serving out there with the Gurkhas in what was called the emergency. And one day he came back in the middle of the day, most unusual, um, with a very sombre face and said, the king is dead. And we went, oh, but we didn't really know who the king was. <laughs> we didn't know what England was really like. We didn't know where London was. A year passed and then it was going to be the coronation, by which time we were in a fit of excitement because there were going to be parades and fancy dress parties um, and there were going to be presents, medals, 
please somebody do it in time for this jubilee. You had a medal on a ribbon, a little thing of the Queen. If I had, if I had mine now, I'd be wearing it today. I got a pencil box with the Queen's face on it, which is one of those double-decker ones. You remember those wooden ones which slid sideways and you pulled the lid like that? <laughs> um, I had a golden coronation state coat. The thrilling thing about this jubilee is that they're going to get the coach out and it's going to clump through the streets, clippity-clop. Empty. Thrilling! <laughs> Imagine yourself in it, actually, if you want. Anyway, so the whole thing was absolutely thrilling, but I didn't know what London was like, I didn't really know what the Queen was like. And then we saw, in the army school in Malaire, twice in black and white and once in colour, the film of the coronation. And I think it was watching the Queen walking slowly up the aisle of Westminster Abbey with, that, with the, her maids in waiting behind her and the great train and a slight swaying and the, the, the coronets on people. I don't know, the whole thing was, became a fairy tale. It became a fairy tale and I thought, this is a wonderful person. Then I heard, read even then, that what she'd said at 21 was that she was going to dedicate her entire life to us and she would never let us down. I thought, that is a heroine. So she went straight up in the board in here, heroine, somebody to follow. So that's when I fell in love with her. Moya, your first impressions, your first memories of the Queen? Well, well, first of all, so just to, just to say, Joanna, that the Queen isn't going in the Gold State coach, so there's a space there. <laughs> ah! <laughs> we can all imagine ourselves there. <laughs> Um, my earliest memory is actually, I was very, quite small, I think I was about six or seven and I was at primary school and um, I think someone in my class, someone's father, might have worked for one of the royal households and it was a time when the Queen, everyone was going dead free mm. and the Queen was getting all her fleet of cars um, converted and um, a few of us from school were taken along to the palace for this great moment and we were given white sweatshirts, which I think I've still got in storage somewhere. <laughs> it said, I, Greenheart, led free. And a few of us sort of were lined up to shake her hand and I can remember vividly, I mean, I was pretty small thinking, she's tiny. Mm. Um, this sort of, you know, this great queen, tiny, tiny. And then years later, I remember being at home one Saturday night and getting ready to go out and I had, um, I love watching those, the greatest hits of the 80s and the greatest hits of the 90s programmes and you had the overlay of everything that was ha happening at the time. And I was just, I suddenly saw the footage of, you know, a bunch of us and our I love lead free oh. sweatshirts shaking a hand going, oh my God. <laughs> that, so that was like my earliest memory of, of, of her was actually sort of meeting her when I was little. But to, but to the point about what made you want to sort of follow her, I have to say, um, I really didn't and I came to the job, it's, it's a question I'm asked quite a lot. I came to the job in quite a roundabout way. I was at the Telegraph at the time um, covering the arts on the Sunday Telegraph and my predecessor on the Royal Brief um, was leaving to go and write books and do other things and he said, oh, I think, this was 2010, he said, I think you should go for it, you should throw your hat in the ring, nothing ever really happens, it's been very quiet for years and you get to go on some nice overseas tours and I was like, I've got no interest in the royals at all, I don't want to do that, I sort of snorted at him. He said, I think, you... anyway, my then editor I think thought, She's the same generation as the younger royals. Maybe we could get her along. Anyway, so I went for it and I was told that you'll have three months to figure it all out and we'll introduce you to everyone. And I think two weeks later, William and Kate got engaged and this giant story came flying at me and I knew nothing. <laughs> um, so that's how I started. But I, was, I sort of had to have my arm twisted because I didn't really think it was a, a brief for me. And 12 years later, I'm still doing it. Look at you now. Exactly, <laughs> absolutely. Well, across all ages, classes and cultures, why this enduring fascination and loyalty to the Queen, do you think? So that's a really good question. Um, and I thought about that one today. Um, I've done quite a lot of travel over the years with the, well, other members of the royal family and particularly recently. And wherever, wherever we go, I always, whoever you're with, which I remember the royal family are with, they always want to ask you about the Queen and you know, what she like and, and I think there's something about the Queen, when you talk about sort of cultural divides, how does she bridge that? There is something I found, you know, I was, went to Barbados recently with the Prince of Wales for the handover, which was really interesting. And when I was doing some sort of scurrying around on the ground before the handover ceremony, going and sort of testing the mood music on the streets of Bridgetown, people were, you know, they're like, you know, changing, changing attitudes towards the monarchy, but they all, we love the Queen, we love the Queen. Why do you love the Queen? We love the Queen because we feel she's sort of a big brother for us, you know. We've got politicians, we don't always trust them, we feel like she's always looking out for us. And I think there's something about the Queen being, not just her longevity, but this sort of trusted 
figure and figurehead. That people feel, you know, she's above politics. She's not trying to do one over on them. She's and she's seen it all. And I think there's something about that that sort of really appeals to people's. It's a trust. I think it's a trust thing. People trust her. They do. Joanna. I think it's absolutely true. I think she's like a sort of mothership. And most people who aren't as old as I am have only ever known the Queen on the throne. That's all they've ever known. So she's been a constant there. And the other thing is, is that she's unknowable. Mm. She's never given interviews. We occasionally get glimpses of what she's like, which is why it was so thrilling to, to do this book, she said, shamelessly plugging it. Because <laughs> you must understand, my beloved people, <coughs> is it that I've collected what other people think of the Queen. I've linked it and introduced it and so on. But it's what other people have thought of the Queen once they met her, from very, very great, dignified, splendid people like Ban Ki-moon or Winston Churchill and so on, right down to somebody who's waving a flag in the street in New Zealand. It's, it's got other people's glimpses of the Queen. And I thought by putting a sort of mosaic together, we could begin to understand her through her behaviour to other people, through her, her, her pattern of life, what she likes, how she entertains people, what she sees as important. And I think that she's been very constant in her faith too. Mm. I think her faith, what, what really surprised me was how, um, how much she respected and admired Billy Graham. Does anybody here remember Billy Graham? Yes. We do, some of us, we do. And we always, because I was a teen, you know, teenage sharing a flat with three other girls in Earl's Court, and Billy Graham used to come and preach at the end of the, in the big Earl's Court t t uh, stadium. And we could hear the loud, the loud, you know, the thing voice saying, come up on the stage if you wish to be saved. And we were, we were <laughs> really? And then I heard that the Queen admired him. And I thought, oh my God, really? But he was a good and serious churchman. And she loved him. And she always had him round, I think, when he came to England. Mm. Um, had him to stay and took his advice and talked to him about religious matters. And that's, that's a sort of something which has faded away from a lot of us. I think when a lot of us were little, Sundays were when you put on nice clothes, something, grumbling or not, you went off to church or, 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 or over the weekends anyway. Now that the country has become more culturally diverse, now people, are, you know, go to the synagogue or go to the mosque or whatever. But generally the sense is that once a week you go and pr pray. And that's sort of fallen away from Christianity a lot, except for the Queen, who goes every week. And I think we admire her for her constancy. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that with this renewed need for independence of various uh, Commonwealth nations that the Queen has retained and will retain till the last day her, the affection that people hold her in and the fascination and loyalty of most, even those who want independence. I think exactly what, um, what you said, Roy, which is that people love the Queen in Germany, they say that there are queens, but there's only one queen. They reckon she's the queen. And in the world, when you talk about the queen, we don't mean the Danish queen or the Spanish queen. We don't. Because they're all there. They're the, all the European royalty. When you count up how many queens and royalty there is in the world, there's a lot. But when you talk about the queen, we talk about this queen. Mm. Because she's been here for so long, because she's held in such high esteem. And it's her. So even people who are absolute <coughs> rabid Republicans love the Queen and respect the Queen. And I don't know what's going to happen when she finally leaves, because I think there will be a great shaking up. And I think a lot of that might even come from the royal family itself, who might be realising that the world has turned on its axis and that maybe a change will be coming. But I loved what the Queen said um, somewhere in my book. <gasps> Someone. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is that she trained up her son, the Prince of Wales, to be the best man he could possibly be for the duty that he's going to have to take over, which is going to be king of a completely different kind of world and a different kind of, you know, he's going to be over a different kind of amount of subjects, whether they'll be the same or different or gone but she's trained him to be the best he can. And why I like the system of monarchy as opposed to voting in a president is that, look, we sometimes get it wrong. And if you're going to have somebody who's, whose life is, to us, pretty terrifying, which is that your every minute of every day is going to be constrained and you'll never be alone, you'll be watched over and guarded <clears throat> and reported on and photographed wherever you are. If somebody's been trained up to it, trained up to it, knowing that's what they're going to do forevermore, 
That's quite good, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. But what stands out for each of you in the Queen's way of working over the years, and how has she faced up to the challenges? And what are those challenges? What, what have those Roy challenges? Royal wants to answer this first. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, I think one of the things that stood out for me, reporting on her for nigh on 12 years, is that as Joanna touched on earlier, you don't really know what she thinks. So when people say, what does she think about this? Well, the likes of me are there to sort of talk to people very close to her. And sometimes I get a very good steer on what she might think about something. But actually, I was writing a big tribute piece about the Queen recently. And some, someone who works very closely with her said, one of the great tactics and one of the great things about the Queen, and he, they used an example. Let's take the state visit of Donald Trump here a couple mm. of years ago. This was the example said person gave, unnamed person, courtier. Um, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, that went incredibly well. The pictures here looked great. The Queen was incredibly jolly. She laughed at his jokes, etc., etc. <laughs> the, the images that were broadcast back to the United States were exactly what Donald Trump wanted. Look at me, I'm with the Queen, isn't this wonderful? It looked brilliant. It went so smoothly. But we will never know what the Queen thought about it. She might have thought, this is a nightmare. She might have thought, this is going really well. But we'll never know, because she's the consummate professional. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of her ways of brilliantly doing the job. The other thing I would say about her, in terms of how, you know, how does she do it, I think she has been very good over the years at compartmentalising bits of her life. And again, this is something else someone said to me recently who knows her very well. We are very used to just seeing the public queen, the monarch, the figurehead, head of nation, head of state. But for her, I think she is the public queen and the private queen, Elizabeth Windsor, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and she has been very good at sort of separating those two. And, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, she wasn't able to be a hands-on mother. Well, which I, I say that. You, there's an amazing film coming this Sunday on BBC One. Oh, do One. say, tell everybody. Listen, put this in your diaries now. Start right. <coughs> well, I went to a screening watch. this morning with, with some colleagues about... Oh, you, Jamie, so... BBC I know. One, yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, the Unseen Queen. It's basically a, a documentary about from childhood to the coronation, and it is 90% made up of unseen home movie footage. And you will... It's incredibly moving. It's very poignant. A few of us had a tear in our eye, including someone here. And you will get a much stronger understanding of what drives her, the challenges she faced, her, her upbringing... But it also, rem there's very, very wonderful footage of her as a young mother with a very young Charles and a very young Anne, very hands-on, very loving. And I think she has been very good at compartmentalising those two bits of her life. And I think we, are only ever, we only ever think of one bit of it. I think very often we forget about the other bit. Do you feel that it's been a massive intrusion uh, into her life? Uh, I'm thinking specifically with uh, the marriage to the fabulous um, uh, Prince Philip, uh, the late Prince Philip, and uh, uh, his, I think, um, affection for the media and to uh, open up the family a little more. Do you think that this was quite difficult for the Queen or did she just take it in her stride? Both, I would say. Um, you have to remember as well, I think, again, the other thing that we also always forget is that this is a woman who was not born to be Queen. Mm -hmm. And so her life changed completely overnight everything about her life from the way she went about it and lived it to the media interest. And actually, you do hear her talking about that. Um, you hear her talking about it at the beginning of this film, her own personal reflections on cameras have always been mm. um, before the embargo, but you won't tell. Um, and she talks a little bit about how, you know, she dealt with that. And I cannot even fathom what it must be like to have spent 96 years in the spotlight in the way that she has, but she has dealt with it remarkably. She has... If she's ever complained, she's done it privately, through the official channels. It's very effective. I think because the Queen has so rarely complained, when she does, boom, you know, people listen to her. Um, but I think her mother gave her some steers as to how... Because her mother, too, was not... Uh, the, the late Queen Mother yeah. was not no, uh, destined for... No, she was queen. Uh, was she? Uh, yes, no. absolutely. And nor was her husband. No. So um, uh, do you think that perhaps she was instrumental in helping... Queen Elizabeth II to actually be Queen Elizabeth II. I think she was, and I think the other, the, the, I would say probably the most important person in her life in helping her learn that role, which again you really, really see in this film, is her father. And actually people now who still work with her say, um, people who remember way back will say, you know, in the early 
years and decades of her new reign, there was always still talk of the king and what would the king do. And, you know, someone said to me, as and when the queen is no longer with us, the one, you know, if there was any sort of theory she had in her life is that she'd be able to see her father again and say, I hope I did you proud. And I think she still, everything she has done about the way she's gone about her job, I think she, she thinks very carefully about the role model of, of her father. And you really see that in this film. Maura, would you, would you let me do something which sounds ghastly? I just want to read a bit, which John, the photographer John Swanell has photographed the Queen several times, and he's a close friend of mine, and I said, John, I'd love to hear something about you photographing the Queen. And he'd photographed her, photographed her, and he'd been asked to do official pictures and so on. And when it came to, um, could he come to the palace to, and look round because he wanted to take a picture in the palace, um, on his recce he noticed a large portrait of King George VI, by positioning the Queen in front of the painting and propping a huge looking glass up in front of her, he would capture her and her father twice in one picture. The Queen asked, as this shoot took place, if he would do another setup, this time without the King. John duly took the, the, um, the memorable picture of, uh, of, of the Queen with her back to the window through which could be seen the Golden Grey Victoria Memorial, I don't know if you remember it, her with the, the great statue of Queen Victoria outside. Th this photograph spread all over the papers. But John was saddened that the picture with the King hadn't been chosen as he thought it really was the best. Much later, the palace PR woman, as he called her, told him that far from disliking the photograph of, the, of her with the, Queen's, the King's portrait, the Queen had loved it so much that she'd had it framed and hung it in her bedroom. Oh, Isn't that the touching thing? Wonderful. Isn't that wonderful. so sweet? Absolutely. I was going to press you for mm. some instances of uh, no heckling from the back, please. <laughs> <laughs> for some uh, examples of the challenges that the Queen has faced throughout her reign and how she's handled them. I think when you look at them, talk about peeling upon Ossa, which I think is the two mountains, one stuffed upon another. When things got bad, things got worse, and we can all remember the Annus Horribilis, when things just were sort of ghastly, and that great and valued and adored family home, Windsor Castle, burnt out, and, and the divorces that were going on, and the, and the sort of a sense of dis-ease amongst the public, people not liking, everybody was cross about everything, and I don't know what it's like, and you have to go on. Her mother dying, her sister dying, and now we've seen her husband mm. dying. And days later, everything in place, beautiful bright hat, flowers, receiving people, doing her duty. I wonder if that gives you a kind of strength. I wonder by, rather like actors who go on stage ill um, and have to perform, and by the end of the show, they're usually better because you make yourself not be ill. And I think through what the Queen's had to do and had to endure, she's made herself not be weak. I thought there's, um, there's an extraordinary thing that happens. When lightning strikes sand, it turns it to glass. There are examples of this in, in South America in the big deserts there. And I think the oddest thing happened, which was when the Queen knew she was going to be made Queen, when she was only 10, mm. And suddenly um, her uncle Edward danced away and her father was made king. And she knew then that her life would be changed, altered forevermore, and she could be the only one who was going to be queen. I think lightning struck her then, and instead of burning her up as it would maybe a lesser person, <coughs> it, made, it forged her into a new creature. And she decided to be that new person of strength and service and... I don't know, constancy is the only word I can think of. She wouldn't let you down, or her down, or us down. She became amazing. And Roy, have there been instances that you've been really surprised, heartened, saddened, on her behalf maybe, by the way the Queen has faced challenges? I have to be honest and say, um, I think the biggest challenges for Her Majesty have come from the thing that she loves the most, which is her family. And um, it is extraordinary, I think, it, the way in which she has faced that in recent years. I mean, when I started doing the brief, it had been relatively quiet, it had been relatively calm for a while. I didn't, wasn't around during the War of the Welses and all that, but you know, of course I, I know all about it and it comes into our coverage sometimes. But if you think about the last few years, what she has faced up to in terms of very difficult family situations, you know, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex 
leading royal life and the way that came about and the way that has played out. The Duke of York, everything that's happened there, losing her husband, and the way that she has, I'd not say soldiered on, but she's really sort of navigated those very choppy waters. I sound like I'm writing one of my entries now, but she, she has, you know, she is, she, at the age of 96, she is dealing with a lot of family drama, a country that is, you know, she's head of nation of a country that is in extraordinary times, mm. what we've been through. And I just think there's something about the way she has faced that. And I know a lot of people, you know, over the years go, oh, the queen is what she puts her head in the sand. She doesn't like confrontation, all of which is true. But actually in her, you know, in her 90s, she's dealt <coughs> with some of the most difficult family situations that would be difficult for any family. And then you play it out with the most, in, in public, with the most famous family in the world. Mm. And I think um, I have been surprised by what she has had to endure and what some of her family have put her through. Um, and I have been pretty heartened by how I've, we've sort of seen her deal with it. I'm not sure that many kind of 96 year olds would, I know she's got a lot of people around her, she's got advisors, all of that. But you know, every word that ever comes out of the Queen and every statement is sort of, you know, poured over by the likes of me and my colleagues and the public. And we have got the Platinum Jubilee coming up next week. We have, you know, there will be, you know, Harry and Meghan coming from America and that will play out in a certain way and, you know, all of that going on. It's a lot for a 96 year old and I think um, it is very challenging. I know it's, you know, we know it's challenging for her and I think she's dealt with it really amazingly, actually. If I can take a few paces back, <coughs> I think the magnificent way in which she enfolded all of us in her sort of care and compassion uh, over um, the, say, the Grenfell Tower fire, mm. or the um, pandemic, or, uh, you know, it seems that whenever she is needed, um, that fabulous, you can quote it much better than I, um, we shall, we shall. We will be with her, we will meet again, we will be with our friends again, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's, it just, whether it be um, she alone, or whether it be in collaboration with her magnificent speechwriters, I think, wow, this woman, it's not only the words, it's the way they are delivered. And there's no, I've never seen her pandering or being insincere. I mm. think that when she cares, when she sends her condolences, when she goes and visits survivors, um, it seems to be with a whole heart. And I wonder whether this grit and this grace is reflected in the way other countries view Britain? Gosh, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think the answer is probably yes. And actually, there is something about the Queen and you know the way she delivers her addresses and her speeches, which are rare these days. And when COVID first hit in 2020, and we were all, you know, a lot of the, the Royal Press Pack were you know, clamoring to the palace, when will we hear from the Queen? When will we hear from the Queen? And you know, I think the palace and the government, number 10, knew that they had one trump card to play if it was to encourage the, the nation to do the unthinkable and have our civil liberties removed, which was the Queen. And I thought the timing of it was brilliant. And, you know, people, it's, the, it's that incredible distinction between her two roles, head of state, mm. official stuff, head of nation, the sort of symbolic thing. And you mentioned Grenfell, and I remember actually very clearly when that happened, and she went with William to Grenfell. And, and sat and for a very long time listened to their stories. And I remember talking to someone at the palace overnight, <coughs> Friday into the Saturday, and it's drooping the colour. And they said she woke up, she stayed up very late, and she woke up very early in the morning and said, We cannot possibly continue with drooping the colour as it normally happens. I'm going to lead a minute silence for the nation from Buckingham Palace. And they were like, Lots of quarters going, We've never changed drooping the colour. We've never changed drooping the colour. And she just said, We are changing it this year. And She's got great instinct, mm. and that doesn't just come from longevity. I just think it, it, she's just got that sort of it. She, mm. she kind of knows what to do in those great moments of crises. So, um, interestingly, a lot of the people who've contributed to this and people I've talked to said she's got a sixth sense. She's, I think this comes from being very in tune with animals, strangely enough. Horses and dogs, she's brilliant. She's literally world class of her knowledge of horses and dogs. She could, she wanted, she always longed to show the corgis because she's got really premium corgis. She loves her corgis. And horses, well, I mean, you know about yes. this. She just is magic with horses. And she breeds them, she trains them, she races them, she understands them. 
and she's made sure that they, she ha that she has that they're trained the Monty Roberts way, which is horse whispering rather than beating them into submission. You uh, suggest to a horse what it might like to do, and guess what? It does it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and she's had all her trainers, and oh, everybody yeah. does that now, and all the cavalry regiments, and everybody have to Ooh, has wow. to do this. But she's got this extraordinary sense about people, and there was one. To my absolute shame, I'm going to forget his name. But if you forgive me, I won't look it up. It was um, a doctor who'd been serving in Afghanistan. And he'd seen some of the most horrific things. He Is it was, David Knott? It was David Knott. He, no, I he love was David Knott. And uh, he, he was invited to one of the private lunches at Buckingham Palace, which are intimate affairs. They're on the Queen's side, and there are maybe six or eight members of the public there with a few courtiers. But the table is small, and you sit with them. Anyway, he was put beside the Queen. And uh, she turned to him during the second part of the meal and said, where have you just come from? And he said, Afghanistan. She said, and what was that like? And he found that suddenly at that moment, he was overwhelmed with the horror of it all. He was, his, he'd lost his mother a year before, and it was whether it was the queen who was about his mother's age, asking him so kindly, and him remembering dismembered children, bits of child children's bodies and the corpses and the blood and the horror. He suddenly couldn't speak, and his, his throat stopped, and his, he began to just tremble and became dumb. And the queen immediately leant over, and on the table there was a little box of biscuits, and he brought the biscuits here, said, these are the dogs. And then they leant down onto the table. There's always a flurry of corgis around your feet. <laughs> and she leant down and began feeding the dogs and talking to him about it and saying, this one's this, and this is the mother of that one. And just talked quietly through, talked to him about the dogs and their names. And at the end she said, there, that's better than talking. So she knew she could sense exactly that he was on the brink of an absolute burnout and he felt completely calm and he wrote about this in the book that it Ooh. was just an extraordinary kindness that we don't we never get to see because we only ever see the formal queen cutting a ribbon or appearing at something wasn't it great she went to the elizabeth line yeah. wasn't it great she sort of photobombed herself she suddenly <laughs> turned up in yellow and everyone went oh my god wearing, and put her, the, wearing her ukraine colors the <coughs> ukraine hat yeah. and then they had to move the thing right down to here because she's very small i loved all that Dylan, if you, Dylan, if, sorry. If, sorry i was just going to say if you haven't listened to david knott's desert island discs where he oh. tells that story it's do. just please do. It is beyond moving, yeah. and you really understand the Queen's sixth sense. Yeah. Wow. Joanna, behind the scenes, mm. um, what are the queen, Queen's likes and dislikes about her role? Do you know? You'd never know. I would have thought people who know her well say, look at the dutiful things she does when she would love to be walking through a forest or taking the dogs up a mountain or something or helping with a harvest. She's sitting on a stage like this, in a town hall, listening to worthy speeches from people who are so overwhelmed by her presence that they're stammering and stumbling, and it's all fairly formal and nothing too exciting, nothing that would frighten the horses. And so she has to sit there while outside the sun is blazing and, I don't know, just all the things that she can't do. She doesn't complain, but I think there must be that in all of us. You see, at the end of the day, I mean, as an actress, I'm treated marvellously well when I'm filming. People collect me, people come and collect me. My clothes are laid out in the dressing room or in the trailer. Um, makeup is there, hair is there to do that. There's somebody to hold your skirt up when you walk over the mud. Somebody says, what do you want for lunch today? Do you want anything? And would you mind if I brought along somebody from the press to talk to you? <laughs> but, you know, everything is done as if, you, as if you are the queen. But at the end of that day, you take your stuff off and you go home and you eat baked beans on toast. The queen can't, can't really ever, ever, ever do that. Mm. And I think that must be a massive restriction. She's trained herself not to mind it. And people, you know more than I do about this, that... People, I mean, if that's the only way you've ever been brought up, but her eyes must look out the window, as she does in Buckingham Palace, when she was being painted by Pietro Anagoni, looking out and she saw a shunt with a taxi. Oh, she said, that'll cost him money. Oh. <laughs> and you just love her for that, you know? <laughs> She's looking at us as much as we're looking at her, but we can escape, and she can't. Yes, yes. Mm. A lifetime. Mm. Extraordinary. Roya, what is the current relationship between the press and the royal family in general, but particularly the Queen. <laughs> Ooh. Um, <laughs> it, well, I think it, it completely depends, if I'm honest, uh, and I think there are some of my colleagues here. I think, it, I think on the whole it's mostly good. It depends which publication or 
broadcaster you work for. It is a very individual thing. Different correspondents, different editors, different publications have different relationships with different households. Um, and are you one of the favourites? I couldn't possibly comment. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't possibly comment. Um, I, it, it's a very interesting relationship and the, the, the best way I can describe it is, and I often use this phrase when people ask me, what's it like? It is like a diplomatic tightrope walk every single week. And, <laughs> you know, you, we, are, we don't work for them. We do not work for the royal family. Our job is not to write press releases and sing their praises all the time and say, great job. When there's a good story to write, positive story, if it's newsworthy, if it makes my news list, my news editor is here, I think, somewhere, great, we'll do it. If there's a story to write that they don't want us to, to do, we will also do it. And, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's a really difficult tightrope to walk because the diplomacy involved is excruciating mm. and you're very aware that you are writing about public figures, but also a family. And I did a story recently, I didn't think it's very contentious, I thought it was stating the obvious that the Queen was never going to live in Buckingham Palace again. And we did it quite big, you know, she made the permanent move to Windsor and that was it. And I was at an engagement the following week with Camilla and um, someone who works with her sidled up to me and said, good story at the weekend, we'd much rather you hadn't written that. To which I just replied, it's not my job to write what you want me to write. Because it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I would say on the whole now, we are much more respectful and bound actually by codes of conduct than perhaps during the 80s and early 90s when I think things were much more rogue than they are now. You know, we, there are, we are very conscious of sort of media law and privacy laws and, and all of that. And I think, you know, during the, the really difficult years of the 80s and 90s, um, the relationship between the palace and the press was much more fractious. That's not to say we don't occasionally get legal letters now and then. <coughs> we do, sometimes, um, from certain members of the royal family, not from the Queen. But by and large, it's a fairly respectful relationship both ways, most of the time. For those who are not uh, involved with the media world, how are royal stories, how do they come about? How do you find out about them, unless it's, you know, it's, uh, just obvious, but uh, or you're surmising or whatever. But how are the how, our royal um, stories? An insider, about and, it's a ah. palace aide. No, is that all these people? These sort of unnamed sources tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you, Joanna. Well, <laughs> I, I, I would say the biggest misconception um, of my job is that members of the households and palaces are just sort of handing out sweeties of stories. I can tell you that. The, most of my stories don't come from the households. I might hear stuff, go to the households and say, "Can you? I've heard this, can you guide me? Is this right, is this wrong? And sometimes they'll be really helpful, great, and other times they'll be like, we can't comment on that. But for my job, um, the majority of my stories come from really good contacts and relationships that I've built up with sources and contacts over more than a decade. Tell us, tell us. <laughs> you see, she can't, she's pressed, she and can't. No, I respect that. It's, 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 as my news editor will tell you, I mean, the amount of sort of phone calls I make going, you can't tell anyone, but it, it's, it's trust. And actually, I remember going back to my old school a few years ago and giving a talk about journalism, and then there was a Q&A at the end, and some very punchy 13-year-old stood up and went, don't you think you just go too far with the royal family all the time? And I was like, oh! <laughs> and I, did, I do remember saying to her, actually, you'd be amazed at how much I know that I don't write. Mm. Yeah. It's tons. And Dame Joanna. <laughs> I would, See you in the bar. Right? <laughs> and I would presume that you have uh, a very similar, uh, you find yourself in a similar situation insofar as I'm sure that you have an insider's view and yet... On not the, really. No? No, not really, because people sometimes say, oh, you're close friends with Prince Charles. And I say, and I don't ever know how to say this properly, I'm not close friends with Prince Charles. He, it, People like me aren't close friends with him. He's immensely nice to me. All of the royal family are incredibly nice to me. But a close friend is somebody who, who you can pick up the phone to and f phone or ask them. I've never done that. I wouldn't know how to do it. Mm. I'm not that. They're extremely nice to me. Um, but that doesn't make you close friends. Mm. So it's a, it's, a funny, it's a funny, odd relationship. The people who are close friends know who they are, and they are the close friends. Mm. And you know, you know who they are, but I don't know who they are. Mm. Um, 
And so this is in compiling your book. Mm. How did you go about finding, apart from the gorgeous uh, uh, general public, how did you find people to give you some insights that, you know... God, I, you? I want to lie here. Can I just lie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did it all myself. No, the truth is, is that the publishers, Hodder and Stoughton, remarkable, respectable people, came to me and said, we are going to... Did you know it's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee? And I went, no, not so soon. My God, we've only just done Diamond or something. They said, no, Platinum Diamond. Oh, my God. And they said, would you like to do a book? And I went, yeah, but I'm not a historian, I'm not a biographer, I'm nothing. How could I possibly do it? And they said, no, 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 we're going to gather masses of stuff, like a kind of armful of confetti, and throw it at your feet, and you'll make a book out of it. And I went, sounds great. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> does that all great. this stuff came in, and of course it was heavy, heavy weight on the, the death of the king, the coronation of the queen. Then, this is a long reign, it gets very sparse, so I thought, well, I can't do a linear story through this. I'll have to do it thematically. Then I had to think what the themes were and look through all my stuff. The, because I'm a pedant, I mean, I'm a, no, that's the wrong word. I'm a dimwit, actually, let me just say that. <laughs> what I meant to say is that I'm not very good at working online, so I would print things out and put them all around the floor like this and go, that's chapter nine. What should we call it? No, that's good. Oh, no, that would go, well, that could go there and that could go there. So a lot of this went on, the house was just covered with little piles of stuff. Then sometimes huge chunks of the book would be taken out when I'd already constructed the chapter and done all the interlinking bits and sat it carefully together. This is boring, isn't it? Anyway, I just no, tell you how books are constructed and then suddenly at the last minute, Michelle Obama pulled hers from her book. Pulled it, her publishers. Annie Leibovitz, do you remember that story about when she photographed the Queen and fake the, news. somebody, fake news, pretended that the Queen had stormed out and she hadn't and it was the BBC, Bishar, I'm very bad, bad, bad people, BBC. So and all that, so, you know, so all that lovely story about Annie, so Annie, gone. You go, no, these were big chunks and everything, I'd balance stuff around. So this was, uh, anyway, this is how I got to write the book. But what I did get to do was to put in some of the bits, because I've met the Queen several times and I've met many members of the royal family, and to put in stories about Princess Margaret, who I really adored. She was fabulous. <laughs> because she didn't seem to have breaks, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and she was very good fun and very smart and very, she adored the theater. And so I really met her through the theater when she'd come backstage and she, she loved theatre folk, if you know what I mean. Mm. And I must just tell you one quick story about Princess Margaret. I was playing Elvira in Blythe Spirit. She's the ghostly wife who comes back to haunt her husband and to taunt the new wife. And so you're dressed for pretty much in white with very, very pale hair and white makeup and so on. And I thought, gosh, I'm going to look like a piece of mashed potato. So I'm always, <laughs> I'm always going to wear a red mask. So you can see who's talking, at least when I'm on stage. You can tell who's talking. <coughs> and Princess Margaret came backstage, and we were all still in our clothes. And she said, why do you have a red mouth? And I said... Um, because I thought I'd look like ectoplasm. And she said, no, I think if you're a ghost and you're dead, you should have, not have a red mouth. No. And she said, come on, let's go up to the party upstairs. Well, the party in the theatre was up in this, it was like here at the back of this, the sort of circle bar, which was all made nice and lovely for a royal presence. And they'd said, we'd had the ruling, Princess Margaret must not have anything to drink. <laughs> what? We said, no, she mustn't. So none of you, nobody would have anything to drink, nothing, no drink. Princess Margaret came up there and you could see her just thinking, this is going to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> so she got hold of me and her lovely lady-in-waiting, Janie Stevens, who's now just sadly died. And she said, come on. And we off we went down to one of the, to, to the, one of the boxes beside the theatre, which was all shut up. The theatre's empty, nobody there. We got inside there and she got out of her thing a little flask of whiskey. <laughs> gorgeous little cigarette. <laughs> And we had a little glass of whiskey and a little chat. <laughs> Pretty fabulous, you must admit. <laughs> Perfection. Yeah. Roya, I must ask you, as someone who knows nothing, uh, not as much as I should about royal etiquette, when Michelle Obama was seen to put her arm round the Queen's waist, was that accepted with grace and with annoyance, or was she actually as she seemed to be, charmed. Totally loved it. Mm. Fabulous. Um, she, the, the whole notion of royal protocol and royal etiquette, the Queen is much more informal than I think people think. And actually, you reminded me, talking about the John Swinnell anecdote, years ago when I was covering the arts on The Telegraph, I interviewed Rankin, mm. who had been commissioned to do a very funky portrait of the Queen, and actually do look up that picture, it's super cool. 
And I remember talking to him about it, and I said, what was it like when you went to go and meet her and photograph her? He said, I was quite stressed, because I spoke to the private secretary before, and I was like, what shall I wear? And they were like, whatever you like. And he's like, shall I wear a suit, shall I not wear a suit? And do I need to wear a tie? And you know, Rankin's quite funky. He doesn't, he's, sort of, he's not really a suit kind of man. And the, 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 the private secretary said, Her Majesty will expect absolutely nothing. He's like, do I bow? And, he, she, he, and they just said, Her Majesty will expect you to do absolutely nothing. Just do whatever you want to do. And he. And it was very funny. He then got super togged up and was sort of bowing all the way down. As she, as she was walking down the corridor with, with Paul Weibrew, her, and, and she was just like, but she's not, she just isn't, you know, she isn't one for protocol. I think there are other members in her family who care about it much more than she does. Mm. I'm obsessed with that phrase, she doesn't have breaks. I'm going to have to use that. That is, <laughs> that is the best phrase ever. I love that. Doesn't have to. Breaks. Don't attribute it to me. <laughs> <laughs> A royal insider said. <laughs> now look, you two, mm. the world has changed a great deal mm. since the coronation. So what do you expect the future of the royal family to be? I don't know, I can't predict. I think the world is changing. For the, for the promotion of this book, I've done, done all kinds of interviews with Australia, New Zealand, Canada. And the last interview I had with Canada said, um, you, you don't, don't you find it odd that we're supposed to be her subjects right over here in Canada. And I said, I'm sure things are going to change. I think the Queen is quite separate from monarchy and royalty and how it's going to be in the future. Mm. I think she's a separate woman, which is why I've tried, because I'm not, I'm not diplomatic or knowledgeable enough to go into the full scope of what it means if we suddenly become a republic and whether we would become a republic or whether we're just going to have a scaled-down royal family, which we keep talking about, or how it will be funded, or where they will be, will they be in Buckingham Palace, or as somebody rather brightly suggested, if we're going to have to re repair the Palace of Westminster, we won't put all the MPs in Buckingham Palace. Yeah. I think that would be quite nice. Anyway, <laughs> somebody said rather grandly, it's not big enough. And I'm like, really? <laughs> anyway, that's the point. Um, I don't know what will happen. I don't know. I hope that, I hope that we will keep our heads and be as steadfast and kindly back again to the treatment we've had from them. Roya, I, do you see any particular challenges for the future royal family? There are lots of challenges. Um, I think things will change a lot under King Charles. I think he knows that um, things need to change. You know, he will open up the palaces, he will open up the residences to the public. I think the biggest challenge for the royal family going forwards is relevance. I wrote a piece for the Sunday Times a couple of weeks ago about the tra transition that we're seeing and happened for a long time between the Queen and the Prince of Wales, and one of my colleagues wrote a piece that ran on the same page, which was fascinating. And it was a sort of litmus test of young people in the royal family. And you know, she, she, said, you know, she went out and asked a few questions and said, you know, what do you think about Prince Edward? And someone said, so 16, who's that? Is that Charles's son? You know, that generation, they, they, they don't know really who the royal family are. Mm. They're not that interested. But Why? they don't know who Laurence Olivier is. They don't know anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I say that? Did I say that? <laughs> they don't know anything. We mustn't take this as a, blue, as a litmus test. They have no interest in, any, in, in virtually anything. You know, I'm, that's horrible. But they are, they, they, I don't know if it's just me and whether I'm 112, but it just seems so odd. Even when I was very young, I knew who George Formby was, even though he was before my time. I knew of these people. I knew who Sarah Bernhardt was. I'd heard of these people at least. But they don't know actors who've just, or, or, or people, they, so I read in the same article, I think, they thought that, um, that Prince Charles was, might have been Harry's, Harry's older brother or something. Mm. You go, how, how can you not, I, I know it doesn't matter, because, but if you, don't, if, you don't have a, if you don't have a wide enough interest in anything, and your interests are so, as they are now, so narrow, and that's part of the phone life, you know, the screen life, is that you're not taught widely, you're told to focus, and you have you can pick your own news, the news that you might like to hear. Exactly. What? Yeah. What's news? Yeah. What is news? Not your selected news. Things I might like, me, stuff for me, things that, things I might not want to hear, and you go, oh, live, darlings, you've got to live. I think I think I think the monarchy will endure. I think I don't see a republic anytime soon, but I think come the reign of King Charles and the reign of King William after that, I think the monarchy is going to be a very, very different thing, and I think they acknowledge that. That's not to say that all the sort of, you know, magic and mystery and ceremony will disappear. It won't, because I think they know that people actually really love that, most people. But I do think it needs to be, and it will be, a leaner machine. I think 
King Charles will have a very different style to Queen Elizabeth. I think King William will have a very different approach to both of them. So times are changing. And you know, people often say the wheels of change move much more sort of slowly inside palace walls and everywhere else. But I think they will speed up under yes. Charles and they will massively accelerate under William. What's your reaction to the way the Queen has been depicted in fiction, in, on film, even Madame Tussauds, but from the sublime to the ridiculous? Do you, and I'm not suggesting that Madame Tussauds is ridiculous, it's fabulous. <laughs> Are you in it? Are you in it? <laughs> no, no. Oh God, no, I was no. in it and I've been sent to Birmingham now. <laughs> <laughs> I think, look, I've got to say something which makes me sound like a pompous prude. I don't watch The Crown simply because I've met a lot of the royal family and I've known them a little bit. And I can't bear to think of people making up, for instance, I'm married, I can't bear somebody to make up a conversation between me and my husband, they've never, never met either of us, and pretending it's the truth. And me and my husband not being able to say, this is <laughs> word beginning with B. <laughs> you know, you can't, it's just, I find it staggering. It's beautifully acted, wonderfully presented, but it's presented as the truth. Mm. Yes, and that yes. frightens me, yeah. because people say, we saw it, and it's in the crowd. It's, it's what was quite interesting was when the second, no, the uh, Series four, right? Three. The last series came out, the one that was going, that was depicting Charles and Diana's marriage, and it was very interesting to me how heavily the royal households briefed against it, because you know previously there'd been very little comment for the first two series, and then the closer it was becoming, you know, people are alive, and it, it, it started to come very close to home, and there was a sort of very heavy briefing against against a few plot lines, particularly because, as you say, you know, particularly in America, people take us, and, and here, take it as gospel truth. I think, but there is, unfortunately, for the royal family, an unbelievably deep-held fascination around the world about them. You know, we saw the depiction of, you know, Kristen Stewart played Diana in Spencer, awful film. Um, is it? I haven't seen it. Oh, I haven't seen it. Oh, don't. I haven't seen it. <coughs> don't bother. No. I'm I, sure but good. I think, but I think the House of Windsor will continue to be for the long haul mm. um, portrayed. And actually, you know, every year Peter Morgan says this is the last series, and then every year he's like, "There's another series coming." And I think yeah. he knows he, it's it's a gold mine. And for each of you, what are the key moments in, in the Queen's reign which you think might appear in future historical films? Oh gosh. Um, the James Bond story. <laughs> I think that was so astonishing. Wasn't Danny Boyle plucking funny? up the courage to go to Buckingham Palace. And she said at once, yes. They, what? What, you will? You'll go ahead with this? And, and apparently the only stipulation she had was that she'd be allowed to say, good evening, Mr. Bond. <laughs> wow. And I think that's the sweetest and most gorgeous. And it shows the kind of fun side of somebody. And the fact she kept it absolutely secret from her family. <gasps> So they had no idea. And when it happened, apparently Prince Charles went, oh, no, what's happening now? When <laughs> suddenly he could see the familiar figure, and he thought it might be Jeanette Charles, who's the great, <laughs> who's the great queen, sort of... Uh, exactly. Like, like, yes. And, and then he saw, the, he saw the familiar corridors at Buckingham Palace, the corgis, and then it was the queen. He went, oh, my God. <laughs> and then, of course, then it all began to happen, and she'd had this cocktail dress made absolutely in secret for the stunt man. Too. Um, and then the whole thing happened, and as she jumped out of the plane, apparently the two young princes behind shouted, Go, Granny! <laughs> <laughs> I've got another good anecdote about this story. Because um, I remember I was at the telecom at the time, and I watched it, and the next morning, which was a Saturday after the opening ceremony, I, ha I spoke to Danny Boyle on the phone about it, put three through the five the PRs, and I said, how, how on earth did you keep that secret? And what was it like going to the palace and you know, asking her to do it? And he said, well, the most extraordinary thing was, we went to the palace, we had a meeting with her private secretary and her team and said, you know, it would it be possible for us to, you know, portray the Queen. We, we suggested a few actresses and they said, you know, let's just try and sort of nail this, pin, pin this down. And it disappeared and went up and actually I think it was Angela Kelly, her assistant, who went up and literally asked her then and there and came down and said, the Queen says, absolutely not. She, she, she's only going to do it if she plays herself. <laughs> Danny Bell was like, "What? We didn't. We, we didn't have the nerve to." We would ne and she was like, "I'm doing it, and I'm doing it myself." Mm. Yeah. So there Fantastic. you go. Yeah. Sweet. Leading lady. Sweet. Sassy. I yeah, mean, and with sass. such guts and such warmth and such. I love it. Well, I, somehow, I hear what you say, and I've known throughout my broadcasting life, 
which is longer than you, most people um, have been alive in this, in this <laughs> room. But, but it's extraordinary that one feels through her body language, through her facial um, uh, expressions, that one knows her a lot better than one actually does. And although one never is, or very seldom, privy to her conversations, um, whether it be at Grenfell, whether it be uh, wherever, that she has a way of connecting mm. with people. And I remember uh, early, 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 before I got into broadcasting myself, seeing uh, the Queen in uh, touring the Commonwealth, and she had a beatific smile on her face as she danced with Kenneth Coander, who was then the president I, of, of uh, I'm trying to think which, which country it was, but anyway, somewhere in a, thank Some. you, thank you. <laughs> but I mean, just wonderful, wonderful woman who yeah. has, I think, is a very soulful woman, mm -hmm. and you can tell by her body language the difference between the Obamas and, for instance, the um, uh, uh, wonderful meeting with uh, Donald Trump are quite, quite um, apparent. <laughs> but, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to turn the floor over to you. We love some questions, and here are your experts before you. Anybody fancy? Please. Hold on, if hold if on, I had to pick an epithet for the Queen, Elizabeth the what? Rather like Richard the Lionheart or something yes, like that. Ethelred the Unready. <laughs> Ethelred the Unready. What would, we, what, would, what would we do? What would we say? What would we say about the Queen? The Constant. It would be Elizabeth the Constant, wouldn't it? I've used that word so often, but it sounds a bit sort of plonk. But it, <laughs> well, it might be Elizabeth... I would say Elizabeth, the one and only. <laughs> ah. Do you have? I would say Elizabeth the Steadfast. It would be similar. Steadfast. Yes. Better than constant. Steadfast. <laughs> Ask a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> or an artist. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Sir. Are there any portrayals of Her Majesty that have made you, that you have watched and said, that's it, that's her? Like, ones that get her, for want of a better term, correct? Um, yes, actually, and actually a very recent one. Um, I was lucky enough to interview Sir Michael Mapergo recently, and he has written a seriously Sweet. lovely fairy tale called There Once Is a Queen, um, and parts of that have inspired what you're going to see next Sunday in the Jubilee pageant, the big pageant on Sunday. And, um, oh God, it was heaven talking to him, and he um, had been to one of those private lunches with the Queen at the palace, and um, he's really captured her in that book because he, you know, it, it speaks to her love of horses and it really gets, to, you know, she's not named as Queen Elizabeth, but it's so obviously her. And, you know, she goes and sits under a thinking tree and with her horse and her dogs and thinks about life. But as I was talking to him and sort of, you know, said, how, how do you get, how did you sort of get a sense of her? And of course, she's a massive fan of Warhorse obsessed with all those, loves it, had been to see the play, had Jerry the Puppet come to see her at Windsor for a private audience. Mm. Um, he talked about this lunch and said he was lucky enough to sit next to her and he said there was a phrase that sort of stood out and he said, as I was talking to her, she suddenly transformed from the Queen, Elizabeth II, to just this granny, a granny just desperate to get, you know, get out of that shell and connect with people. And I think that sort of infuses this wonderful fairy tale. And actually, it's really sweet, that book, and beautifully illustrated. And I just feel he's sort of got the essence of her really well. I, I liked Stephen Frere's film. I can't remember what it was called. Was it The Queen? What was yes. It called? Was it called The Queen? Yeah. I thought that seemed to be a, a very interesting take on it. Helen Mirren, who's pretty faultless anyway, I thought she, she did it with such some sort of... Grace, because she's not remotely like the Queen. No. But somehow she seemed to capture a kind of queenliness. Yes, yes. That was very good. And she didn't over-egg the pudding. Mm. I thought that she she didn't make herself um, uh, just unapproachable or whatever. She just seemed to embody something uh, within uh, mm. our concept of, mm. of, of Queen Elizabeth II. It was, I thought she did extraordinarily well, and particularly, as you say, she looks like nothing like her. Her physique is nothing like her. her she's, I thought she really... And that, that her interac interaction with... Um, forgive me, a colleague of yours... Uh, Sheen, uh, Michael Sheen. Yes, 
as Tony Blair. Sad, yeah. This is very, very Absolutely. clever. And, and of course, Sheen is nothing like Tony Blair. Was, no. And Sheen is nothing like David Frost. I mean, actors. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying that you're nothing like Patsy? Are you? Oh, well, oh. I think we have some um, questions. Sorry. At the microphone. I saw the Queen before any of you were born, except for Joanna. In, in 1957, I was in my first year at university, the University of Maryland, mm. and we had the Queen's football match. It was a match between the North Carolina and uh, University of Maryland, where I was a student, a freshman student, and the uh, Rolls Royces came around, and it was advertised as the Queen's football match, and uh, she got out and waved to the crowd, and um, it's, it's just something I'll never, I remember, and this was many, many years ago. How lovely. Wow. How sweet. So I saw the Queen one year after the coronation. Wow, brilliant. How brilliant. That's what's the value of being very old. <laughs> <laughs> I could be your mother. I was three. <laughs> <laughs> On the day of the coronation. And I remember. I was born in 1941. <laughs> Did you think, I, I mean, I'm intrigued quickly. Did she seem to you a sort of very young, glamorous, dynamic? She, Beautiful Both she and, and Philip came out, and it was advertised as the Queen's football match. She went to meet the president, I forgot who it was at the time, and uh, she wanted to see a football match and, and when she was in America. Uh, and um, the, everyone stood up and applauded, and she um, and Philip uh, went. And uh, after the match, um, everyone waved and, uh, as the roles mm -hmm. went away. So sweet. I'm someone in history. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sweet, sweet. Gosh, you should be in the next film. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, where the hell were you in The Queen, <laughs> the film? <laughs> Any other? Hiya. Yeah. Um, I have a question here from Kenilworth Library that's come in from everyone watching in Kenilworth. Um, they've said, do you have a favourite decade of the Queen's reign? You've got quite a few to choose from. <laughs> I would I would say the fifties. When she was a, when she got married, and then her father dying, and then her becoming queen and being crowned, and then suddenly going on these immense tours around the world and having her babies. I mean it seemed to, it seemed packed full of incident. And she was so young, and all the photographs you see of her in those days, you realise how immensely slim we all were. Exactly. We've all got fatter. She had a little 23-inch waist. She was as pretty as a picture. So beautiful, she and her sister Margaret. And Prince Philip, who was just the handsomest man in the world. And the two of them cut such a dash around the world. And the world was uncomplicated then. We all seemed to be less cynical um, and, I mean, probably more naive in many ways. I'm not sure that was bad. There was something very sweet and open about the world then, it seemed. Anyway, in the tours they did and the way that they were received and the re very respectful way that the, the, the press always treated them. and It seemed kind of sweet away, where people like me, it's probably when I fell in love with aprons. <laughs> I just adore aprons. <laughs> I still have some and wear them all the time. <laughs> Favourite decade of yours? I think it's probably now. I think it would be the last 10 years that I've been doing this job because... It's really interesting, actually, when, whenever you're sort of putting up a story or, you know, or you're thinking about which member of the royal family it is, there's a sort of thing at work at the Queen is box office, and she is. And whatever she thinks about something, or you know, it all trickles down from the Queen. And, and I, it has not been a dull decade that I've been doing this beat. It has been extraordinary. Jam-packed. Jam-packed, huge change. And, um, yeah, I mean, for me, it would be the last 10 years. The extraordinary thing is, if I may butt in, um, that... Seemingly, she has become even more um, accessible and stronger. I remember when she was so devastated when she had to uh, give up the Royal Yacht Britannia, etc., etc. I can't remember whether it, was, whether it was before or after that she there was this dreadful fire at Windsor, which mm. really devastated her um, and other members of the royal family. Since then, she has dealt with all kinds of national 
and more personal um, uh, dilemmas, tragedies, uh, embarrassments, etc., etc. And each time, I think from the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, we have seen her become, come into herself and have such, uh, as I say, a strength and a grace. A and somehow one feels that one can rely on her no matter what. Hell can freeze over, there could be whatever disaster happening. And as long as she has been there, she has some way, so, somehow been mm. reliable, mm. someone that one can almost sort of gauge. And comforting. Uh, she always seems to yes. send the right messages. When there's a drama around the world or something tremendous has happened and a message comes from the Queen, we all feel so proud that she's written it so beautifully. Yes. And absolutely. it's just what we wanted to say, and hurrah, she's done it. Yeah, yeah. And we think of the people at the other end of the message, thinking how thrilling it would be to get congratulations or commiserations from the Queen. Maybe the politicians could take a few leads. <laughs> <laughs> Any other delicious questions? Hello, ladies. Good Hi. evening. Hello. Um, if I may ask this question, um, how difficult is it really for the Queen not to get involved in politics and kind of sort of turn her head the other way domestically or international situations or crises? Well, as far as I can gather, I think she knows more about politics than almost anybody alive. Mm. She's met all the presidents, all the prime ministers. She's been around all the Commonwealth countries and non-Commonwealth countries. She's picked up. She has to read her red boxes every single day. So she knows everything. But her position is that she will say nothing. And none of us have been party to any of the prime minister's conversations she's had. But And I imagine she never gives advice. But I think rather like psychotherapy, <coughs> they don't give you advice. They just ask a question which might make you think about something. <laughs> and I think that might be the way that she deals with it. Um, people say, what will happen when Prince Charles becomes King Charles? He's been the best Prince of Wales you could ever remember. He's been fantastic for the causes he's mm. embraced and the, the, the light he's poured into things and the energy and effort he's put into things. When he becomes king, he won't do that. Yeah. People say, oh, what will he do? And he, go, he won't do that. He knows the rules. Come on, don't be stupid. He knows the rules. But while he isn't there, he can talk. But when he is there, like the Queen, he won't. And I'm amazed at how he's been, he has filled his life with really meaningful things to do. I have had the absolute honour to be involved with the, uh, uh, with his uh, trust for a thousand years. Yeah. And I tell you, there is something like the last time um, uh, I saw figures, there was something like an 84% or is it 87% success rate mm. dealing with youngsters who have come from hell, mm. who have come from real um, uh, uh, being deprived, etc., etc. And I've even had the privilege of, of meeting a few in, um, in prison who, had, who were imprisoned for uh, nothing as, as, as seemingly trivial as drugs, but actual murder. And it's extraordinary that even there he has reached out and given um, an extraordinary helping hand and not from a position of um, privilege and um, being patronizingly kind, but actually helping people who I've seen talk to fabulous people, young people who have spent their lives um, hurting each other, um, themselves, either um, uh, through lacerating their skins or their minds or whatever. And because they have had the privilege of, of being introduced by um, the Prince of Wales Trust to actually be, to be put together with a mentor, they have found a reason to actually turn their lives around. They have found a reason to turn their lives around, not being told this is the way to do it. And I had the temerity, I'm going to shut up in a minute, but I had the temerity when um, Gordon Brown was in power to say, you know, it, it, in power, was uh, uh, Prime Minister, to say, you know, honestly, we could take, the, the country could take a lot of um, leaves out of the Prince of Wales's approach to uh, dealing with young people. And, um, you know, I know so it would be seemingly very expensive for social services, but perhaps not. And uh, he said, yes, wonderful idea. And I think that's the end of that uh, conversation. <laughs> 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 Any more questions? <laughs>
I have one here. Um, tonight's topic has been all about a, a queen for all seasons, and I'm very conscious that we're heading into a new season of life for the queen. We've talked about a transition to a future monarchy. Obviously, there's been lots in the press about her mobility and, and how things are changing for her as she grows older, as we all do. And I'm very curious um, as to your thoughts of how she will endeavor to balance the needs for herself as an individual in this new season, um, but also how she'll endeavor to continue to connect and uh, be who she is and all these lovely things that we've talked about tonight. And what will that look like in this unique season that we're heading into? Well, <laughs> um, it's a difficult balancing act, isn't it, between knowing everyone wants to see you everywhere and knowing and understanding your limitations as a 96-year-old and just sometimes having good days and other times not having good days. I think in terms of the Platinum Jubilee, I think um, the Queen will do her very best to be, you know, to make as many events as she can. Um, she won't want to disappoint people, but at the same time, as the palace sort of guide us these days, you know, they only confirm on the day when she's going to attend, so that then it's a lovely surprise when she does turn up to Chelsea and when she does turn up to Paddington. In terms of beyond that, I think what the Queen has been brilliant at over the last few years, actually much more successful than lots of us, is really adapting uh, to the work from home scenario. And now that she has permanently moved to, to Windsor, um, most of her future engagements will be held at Windsor. And you know, it's not hard to get people to come and see her, whether that's prime ministers of Canada, as we've seen recently, or you know, um, presidents. People really want to go and see the Queen. And so that's not to say I think she's going to become a Zoom-only Queen after the Jubilee, um, but it's a good way of her continuing to connect with people. And if, you know, we, we still see her in the palace are very good at putting out pictures and you know, clips of her. But I think we have to be realistic, as I wrote recently in this big sort of transition piece, you know, the state opening of parliament, not seeing her there, and the very poignant image of the crown in front of Charles, that, you know, that image in itself, you just looked at Charles and William's faces and they, you know, it was dawning. You know, she might have had a bad day mobility-wise, or she might have planned and thought, people need to start seeing this. I'm not going to be here forever. This is what's coming. This is what I'm planning. Um, and you know, my argument in that piece was actually that it was quite carefully planned by her. And I think we will probably see a few more big set pieces um, where she delegates. And you know, I think we're going to see that at Troop in the Colour this year. I wrote that last week. I, you know, she's not going to sit on the parade ground for the whole 90 minutes. And who can blame her? Um, so that's not to say I think her role will not be diminished, but I think we have to be realistic. And it goes to what Joanna says, we, we have only ever known the Queen and she's conscious of the fact that, and I think, you know, I hate to talk about the future, but I, I've always said, I don't think this country is even vaguely prepared and the world for how it's gonna feel, the shock it's gonna feel when she's no longer around. I think it's going to be seismic. I can't even get my head around it. Um, but I think, you know, she understands she needs to prepare us. And I think we have been seeing that for a while now. Do you know what I'd love to do from us as a present back to her? Would be to say, Your Majesty, we just adore you and thank you for everything you've done. From now on, will you do only what you want to do? Yes. Go to the Derby on Saturday. <laughs> Don't turn up to ghastly, boring speeches from Parliament. That's awful. <laughs> do exactly what you like because you've earned it and we want you to have that. Of course, she'll always do her red boxes and go on being dutiful. But we just want her, we want to say, be free now, now. Do exactly what you want. And that would make us the happiest of all. Wonderful. That would be the best present to the nation. What do you reckon? Yes. 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 Do you think she's been handling it pretty well thus far? <laughs> I think she is, though. I think she is being much more selective about what she turns up to. It's time. Last question. Should we it's time. This is the very last question. Right, OK. Right. Can I just take you back to the year 1997, when the monarchy was in dire trouble and the death of Diana? What do you think was the Queen's role in really pulling it back there and really building a monarchy which people have loved ever since at a very, very difficult and dangerous time for the monarchy? It's a good question. Mm. I would say... Um, I would say that period... It, sh it shows how well she takes advice and, you know, huge screaming of the press, where is our queen? You know, why aren't you here? And, you know, we all know that she felt she wanted to be sort of a grandmother first. But actually what tipped the public mood over the edge and sort of back, pulled it back, was that extraordinary live, live broadcast she gave from the palace. 
speaking as she's, you know, she starts saying, I speak to you as, you know, a mother and a grandmother from the heart. And it was extraordinary. You know, you see the footage of that and she, it, the world is, is waiting to hear what she says. And I think that is instinct. Um, I think she knew what a dangerous thing <coughs> it was. And I think the public responded to her extraordinarily well, but it was a dangerous, you're right, it was a dangerous time. And um, it, it's interesting whether or not Charles will be able to, to, to pull things back in a similar way. I think the Queen is sort of unique like that, actually, in terms of people listening to her. I think we've got, there's a, I keep on saying, do look at it. But anyway, if any of you are lucky enough to buy the book, <laughs> please look at some of the things, because Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, said in a speech to the public, she said, I beg you to give all your love and support to the daughter in this lonely Ooh. and awful role she's now got to take on. She didn't say awful, but she said, a really testing and solitary role. There's nobody who is going to be equal to her anywhere. She will be above everybody, including her husband, her children. It doesn't matter who. She will be above it, and people, nobody can tell her what to do. And I think that it's. I think that we've then got to lend all our love and support, or become a republic. But don't let's be half-hearted. If Prince Charles, which he will become King, king Charles at some time, let us just go <coughs> save the king, mm. and let's go on in the way that the Queen would have wanted us to go on. You know, there's nothing worse than people going, oh, it's not like the Queen. You go, of course it's not. Of course not. We all know it's not going to be like that. We all know it's not going to be like that. And guess what? The Queen wasn't like King George VI. Either. Absolutely. Every successive monarch is different. But I think one of, her, one of the highlights for that terrible time, um, uh, the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, was at the gates of Buckingham Palace uh, when the beer and the cortege went past and people were... Uh, the expressions were stiffened and, and, and quite um, almost angry in, in some cases. But it was the Queen who, who bowed. And I thought that spoke volumes to all of those who were so angry with um, her initial uh, uh, seeming uh, lack of, of, of uh, understanding of how the, how, the, um, how the whole nation felt. I think she understood only too well. But we, we also have to realise... <coughs> I've, I lost my own mother very recently at the, at the, very, at, at the age of 95, and I, and I do realise that having been born almost in the Victorian era, to have come all the way through to now, and to have handled what she has handled, I think, so carefully and so well, and with such devotion to us, I think um, pretty not that's pretty good. I think she was, she was, uh, she's done all right. Yeah. Mm. I hope you agree. Yeah, we do, we do. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I adore you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>Don't you think these are the two most fabulous experts you will ever see on what's really going on with Elizabeth II? And I mean, I bet, keep on looking, they'll take you through uh, the next decade or so. I mean, wow. Thank you ever so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.